Today I'm going to respond to a video posted on Christianity.com from Mary Moeller. Mary directs the Seminary Wives Institute at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, where her husband, Albert Moeller, serves as president. In this video, Mary answers the question, should women wear head coverings in church services? I'll let you watch her answer in its entirety while I interject with some thoughts on her main points. Let's begin. So what do we do with this head covering issue? It's a topic that's discussed amongst those who want to discuss gender issues. We, we read about it in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, clearly it's an issue that sometimes people think it's a gotcha moment because they'll say, okay, you say you believe in biblical inerrancy, you say you literally believe what's said here, okay, where's your head covering then? And so we need to take that seriously and, and look at how we, how we address it, how do we answer that question? My thing is, what is Paul saying here? What is his intention through this passage? It's easy to throw off a lot of things, and, and egalitarians particularly like to throw off things that are cultural, and they'll say, look, we don't do it that way anymore, the culture's different, therefore we, we change really the intention of the passage. So I want to be honest to what Paul is intending. I think the gotcha claim that she's speaking of is actually completely valid. Egalitarians point out the inconsistency of when complementarians dismiss head covering as cultural, but say that women must submit to their husbands and they cannot teach or exercise authority in the church. Well, that is inconsistent, because Paul not only grounds marriage roles and male eldership in the creation order, but head covering too. So while I wouldn't want to charge people who arrive at the cultural view of head covering as not taking this passage seriously, I would say that it is inconsistent complementarianism. Is he talking by a head covering? Is he speaking about a piece of lace over a woman's head? Is he talking about hair? Is he really talking more about an attitude? Now, we are told that culturally in this time, men and women wore clothing that looked similar to each other. They wore like head to toe toga type things. And so if they were bowing down in prayer in some type of church gathering, it is possible that from a distance you could not tell the men from the women unless one had a head covering on. So I understand that, but we clearly don't wear togas anymore. Until recently we wore dresses versus suits and ties, and that's another whole issue. But you could tell from a distance who a man was and who a woman was. The claim that men and women wore head-to-toe togas is actually not true. A Roman man would wear a toga on special occasions, like during civic ceremonies, but not women. The corresponding dress for Roman women was the stola, not the toga. Now having said that, I don't want to give the impression that all men wore togas and all women wore stolas, because that's not true. There was no dress code. Corinth was a multicultural city and you would find all types of different clothing in the streets. But the one thing that a respectable woman would not wear was the toga. Now why is that? Togas on men were normal, but if a woman was to wear it, it had an association with sexual immorality. As Dr. Kelly Olson points out in her book, Dress and the Roman Woman, in Roman antiquity, prostitutes and adulteresses were supposedly immediately identifiable from their clothing. Both wore the toga. Now, Kelly says supposedly because Roman historians don't actually believe prostitutes and adulteresses were compelled to wear the toga. So they believe it was a cultural association, not that the sexually immoral woman actually wore it. But no matter if they wore the toga or if it was just an association, it still means that for a respectable woman, it wouldn't be something she'd consider wearing because of what it would communicate. This means that the picture that Mary created for us of men and women looking visually the same in a head-to-toe toga with a woman needing a head covering just to tell them apart is untrue. What she's saying is that a head covering was a visual indication so you could tell who the women were in the congregation. But Paul's reasons for why that this symbol is to be practiced was different. He says that a head covering in this context is a symbol of authority. So its purpose is that while we're worshiping, we're to symbolize truth about biblical manhood and womanhood. It's not so that we can tell one another apart. Finally, it's also important to highlight that in verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 11, 
Paul says that in all of the churches, they did not have a, the custom of an uncovered woman. So it's not that he's dealing with one church only, but in every church, no matter what their cultural customs were, the churches only had one practice. That's men uncovering their heads and women covering their heads, because that was the Christian tradition, not any particular cultures. And so there's that debate. So, so if I were to wear a head covering in 2014 in this society, I would run the risk of being confused with being a Muslim because Muslim women cover their heads. And I certainly don't want to be confused with a Muslim woman who's wearing that head covering in a subservient, degrading manner in the way that she is treated in her culture. So, so that doesn't work. So you say, well, what about a hat? Well, I live in Louisville, Kentucky. Women wear hats, particularly around derby time. And let me promise you that those women are not wearing hats that are saying, by the wearing of that hat, I'm under the submission of my husband. This is, this is an authority issue. Paul doesn't command any particular style of head covering. He gives an action to perform, cover your head, not an object to wear, like wear a hijab. So the type of covering one uses is completely up to you. It's Christian liberty. So if you don't want to be confused with a Muslim, you could wear one of the dozens of different styles that no Muslim woman would ever wear. Only if you wore a hijab is there a possibility for this type of confusion. No one sees a woman wearing a scarf or a mantilla and thinks that person must be a Muslim. Now, with regards to hats, she points out the fact that the world around us wears hats too. And when they wear it, they're not affirming biblical womanhood. And that's true, of course, but we have to remember that this symbol is not for the world around us. It's a visual picture for the gathered church, and Paul says for the angels too. So it doesn't matter what other purposes and meanings that people outside the church attach to it. This is a Christian symbol for when we are praying and prophesying. So, so then you say, well, what do we do? Well, I wear a wedding ring. But my husband wears a wedding ring as well, so that, that doesn't do it. What about this? What about the fact that I take his name? I was very proudly my father's daughter until the day that I got married, and then there was no question I would be taking my husband's name. There was no question that he would take my name. That would never enter into it, because I am now stepping from my, my, hus my father's authority to my husband's authority. Our children are named with my husband's name, not with my name. Now, that is countercultural in 2014 because there are many feminist women who would not think of taking their husband's name, or they'll hyphenate it perhaps, but they're not just going to make it a cut and dried issue because it does symbolize authority. So, therefore, to me, taking his name uh, does fulfill the intent of this passage. First, I would have to argue that taking one's name does not signify that you submit to your husband. While she's absolutely right that some feminists won't do this, we do have egalitarians and non-Christians alike who do take their husband's name, and they don't intend to make any statement about the authority structure in their home when they do so. Also, taking your husband's name is a permanent thing, but Paul's instructions are only for when we're praying and prophesying. And it also makes for a pretty poor symbol unless we're going to wear name tags full time. But in all seriousness, the more important thing is that we don't have a right to change what God has commanded us. We can't replace baptism with waving a flag over a new member like the Salvation Army does. And we can't replace head covering with a wedding ring or a last name. We take the symbols that God has given us and we hold fast to those. Now, I could be completely wrong. It could be that Paul intended for me to wear a head covering, but you know what? On Judgment Day, I will not be responsible for that because of this. My husband, whose authority I stand under, has never once asked me to wear a head covering. And he, by coincidence, happens to be a theologian who will have studied this passage in the Greek, and so therefore I put it all on him. And if I was wrong on this, it's going to be his responsibility and not mine. But in all seriousness, I believe that the intent of this passage is for me to have an attitude, whether in a church setting or in society, that I am under the authority of my husband. I gladly accept that role. It has nothing to do with my intelligence or my abilities. And one way I do that is by taking his name proudly. If you're interested in studying this passage of scripture in more depth, head on over to headcoveringmovement.com study. There you'll find a guided study to 1 Corinthians 11 with articles, ebooks, sermons, and videos to help aid you as you work through this passage.